Welcome to 24 Hours of Pass, Summer Preview 2015. We're excited you could join us today for Sean McGowan's session, the Enterprise Scripting Workshop. This 24 Hours of Pass event consists of 24 consecutive web, live webcasts delivered by expert speakers from the Pass community. This session is a preview of one of the many technical sessions that will be presented at the Pass Summit in October this year. Recordings will be available in one week at www.24hoursofpass.com. My name is Neil Hamby. I'm the moderator. I'm a SQL Server professional for the last 18 years. I'm a practice lead SQL Server consultant at Knighty Consultancy based in London in UK. I also run the London Pass chapter and the Pass Professional Development BC, frequent presenter of Pass events and UK conferences. I have a few quick introduction slides before I hand over the reins to Sean. He will speak for 40 to 45 minutes and then we will move on to the Q&A where you can ask them any questions you may have. Next slide, please. If you have any questions or if you experience any experience, any issues, just type your question into the question pane on the GoToWebinar control panel and someone will assist you. Feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A field at any time. Once we get to the Q&A portion of the session and maybe during the session, we will read off your questions to the speaker. Since all attendees are muted, you will need to submit your questions by typing into the Q&A field. There will also be a short evaluation at the end of the session. Your feedback is important to us, so please make time to take a moment to complete it. It will appear in your web browser after the session completes. Next slide, please. 24 hours have passed would not be possible without the support and dedication of our sponsors. They are the reason for this event is available free of charge. If you'd like to take a moment to thank the presenting sponsors, Microsoft, Dell Software, and Adira. In addition, I'd also like to thank the supporting sponsors for this event, HP, SQL Century, and Pyramid Analytics. Next slide. Next, I'd like to bring your attention to the upcoming PaaS Summit, taking place in Seattle, Washington, from October the 27th to October the 30th. Past Summit 2015 will feature over 200 sessions with world-class SQL Server experts. Planned and presented by the SQL Server community for the SQL Server community, Past Summit is single-handedly the largest gathering of SQL Server and BI professionals in the world. With over 5,000 registrations from all over the world, Past Summit is also a great place to network and meet face-to-face -face with experts, peers, and MVPs. More importantly, Pass Summit delivers on providing you with the answers to your SQL Server issues, along with knowledge, strategies, and skills you need to stay ahead of the curve. Save right now by using the discount code 24HOP15. When you register, optimize your savings by registering before the next time frame, end of September, Sunday 20th. Next slide, please. Make sure you explore everything past has to offer for the data professionals. You can join local user groups around the world, virtual chapters, find free online resources through our learning center, and read up on the latest community news in the Connected newsletter. For those interested in business analytics, check out the PaaS Business Analytics Conference happening in May this year, or next year, sorry. Visit www.passbaconference.com for more information or to subscribe to our bi-weekly BA Insights newsletter. Next slide. And now, please allow me to present the speaker of the hour, Sean McGowan. Sean, it's all yours. Please take it away. I'm trying to get to the next slide. There we go. I kept telling me security concerns something. I guess those are all live links in there. <coughs> so, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Sean McCown. I am a certified master in SQL and an MVP for, I don't know, I think like seven years now. Um, you see here I've got uh, around 20 years of experience in databases, and <clears throat> I am the co-owner of the MidnightDBA.com website where we do just tons of uh, free SQL Server videos, and we have a, a very popular web show called DBAs at Midnight where we... Uh, uh, where we talk about all kinds of things. Um, there's really no topic that's taboo. Uh, we try to stick. We, we try to stick with IT if we can, but we, we go off the reservation sometimes. Um, <clears throat> I am also co-owner of Midnight SQL Consulting, 
uh, where you know clearly it, it's pretty clear what that does. And uh, recently, we started up our new software company, uh, Minionware, and you can uh, you can see that uh, by going to minionware.net. And we are the authors of the uh, becoming very very famous uh, Minionware, the the free Minion tools for reindexing and backup. Um, other than that, I think it is about time to get started, isn't it? Yes. <clears throat> so this is a preview of our enterprise scripting workshop. Now, <coughs> when when they first asked me to do this, I had no idea how, you know, this is a whole day of content, and we've even got more than a day of content. So I didn't really know how to break this up and what to teach. So I figured what I would do instead of trying to cut and paste things together, I thought I would kind of lay the groundwork for you guys like I do in the session itself. So <clears throat> I'm just going to kind of go through the morning discussion. There will be a demo, but most of this is going to be discussion. Uh, I welcome all kinds of questions. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. Um, if Neil thinks it's relevant, he'll pass it on to me. Uh, you know, during the session, he'll interrupt me in the session. And Neil, if I could, if you could tell me when there are about 10 minutes left, because, you know, I'm not very good at keeping track of time. Um, I'm getting feedback. Is anybody else getting feedback? Okay. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I'll, I'm just going to go through the beginning. And there we go. And it's already story time. <coughs> so there are two questions I'm going to answer here. Um, right off the bat is, is why enterprise scripting and who the hell am I to teach enterprise scripting? Well, I mean, a lot of DBAs have had a lot of experience with scripting. And, and by the way, I'm not really big on slides, so you're going to be staring at the, at the same slide forever here. I don't, I'm not one of those guys who will put stuff in bullet points and just sit there and go through slides just for the sake of having them. So if you're doing something else along the way, feel free to do it. Um, you know, it'll be clear when I'm doing a demo, but you don't have to sit there and stare at your computer. You can go ahead and restore that database while you're while you're listening to me. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, who am I to teach enterprise scripting? Well, um, you know, not only have I been doing this for a couple decades now, but I am in one of those unique positions that almost every shop I've been in has been a very very large shop, um, especially for its time. And a lot of times I have been <clears throat> like either the only DBA or the first DBA or one of only two DBAs in very large shops. And what is very large? Well, let's see. Uh, my first shop ever was back in 95 where we had 500 SQL boxes and only me as a DBA. And this was back in SQL 6.0, right? So... We even had multi-terabyte databases back then. I remember having a terabyte and a half database back then, um, back before anybody else had terabyte databases. Um, in fact, most people were still looking up what terabyte meant. I've been in other shops where we had two and 3,000 servers, and there were only two of us. And a lot of times I was even the first DBA there and started hiring the team. So I've been able to... Uh, I've, I've been able to... Uh, manage these environments by myself or with almost no staff whatsoever for a very long time. So I think that's what makes me qualified to do this enterprise scripting. <clears throat> now it's story time. So I'm going to tell you two stories, um, and I promise they're going to be relevant. They don't sound like they're going to be, but they will be. And they're going to be more relevant in the pre-con itself because we're going to be able to expand on it more. But this is, remember, this is kind of setting the tone for the entire workshop, right? So the first story is about tennis. When I was in junior high, I joined the tennis team. I didn't know why. It just seemed like the thing to do, right? <clears throat> and so I was in tennis for a couple years there, and I won quite a few of my matches. I mean, you know, I, I lost some, but I won probably 80% or so. And I was feeling pretty good. Um... When I went to high school, I was like, well, I'm going to join the tennis team again because, you know, I've been doing really well with that. And so the first week, I get on the court, and I'm just getting eaten alive. I mean, these guys are just running me ragged. One side of the court to the other, one side of the court to the other, one side of the court to the other. And no matter what I did, I couldn't seem 
to win a match, no matter what. Now, the coach took me aside, and here's the difference. In high school, we had a real tennis coach. He was a real semi-pro, uh, worked, worked at a tennis place kind of real tennis coach. And junior high, you know, we had the volleyball coach who, you know, they wanted a tennis team and said, Harry, you're in charge of the tennis team. And so she didn't really know anything about tennis at all, so, you know, I was in the same boat that everybody else was. <clears throat> but this tennis coach, he takes me, a, he, you know, he, he takes me a, aside and he says, now, you know, I've been watching your game, and the problem with your game is you. He says, you're letting these guys bounce you from one side of the court to the other, and, <clears throat> and you're not controlling the ball. And as a matter of fact, every single time they knock it to the right side, you knock it right back to them. And then they hit it to the left side, you run over to the left side, and you hit it right back to them. And then they hit it to the right side again, and you hit it right back to them. And they keep doing that until you are so tired that you make a mistake. They don't have to be better than you are. You're losing every single game. They're not winning it. <clears throat> so that's story number one. This will tie in a little bit later. Story number two, it's along the same lines, only this one's about martial arts. For those of you who know me, know that I've been in martial arts for decades. I'm 45 now. I started when I was 15. Do the math. <coughs> and <clears throat> along the times that I was a, oh, a green belt or a brown belt, my instructor takes me al uh, alongside and he says, look, there's a problem with your techniques. And I was like, wow, this is sounding kind of familiar. And he said, that problem is you. And I was like, really? Is this like a theme now, right? So he says, technically, you're doing everything okay. There's no problem. You know, when, when there's a punch in the technique, you do the punch. When there's a kick, you do the kick, and you do it accurately, and you do it to the place you're supposed to. But the problem is, is you haven't improved your techniques from the, I mean, significantly since the time you learned them. You're still doing them like you did when you learned them. And so it's kind of like, and this is, this is where the interactive portion of the, of the pre-con kicks in. So I'm, I'm having to translate here because I, this is a really, really interactive pre-con. So now I'm having to do everything myself. So this is, this is kind of hard for me. Um, <clears throat> but it's kind of like when you learn how to write. You make these big block letters on these big pieces of paper, right? On, the, on these pieces of paper with these big double lines on them. <clears throat> but hopefully you're not still writing like that when you're an adult, right? So there's a way that you learn to write, and there's a way that you end up writing with cursive, and hopefully not like a doctor. I mean, hopefully you do something legible, but there's a way that you, you do it in practice. And the same thing is true with your martial arts techniques. There's a way that you learn it, and then there's a way that you do it after you sophisticate it and you learn what you're doing and you get the timing in there and you start rounding corners, you start doing all kinds of things in there that make it an actual technique and not this big blocky thing that you, that you learned and you've never bothered sophisticating. <clears throat> and oddly enough, databases are the exact same way. So many people do databases the same way they always have. They administer their environments the same way they always have when they learned how to do it, and they've never bothered sophisticating it. They've never bothered saying, okay, this is a technology that I have at my disposal, and I just learned the syntax of it and what it's for, so now I'm going to use it that exact same way, and I'm never going to sophisticate it. So, we, we, you know, we've got to get you past that. And unfortunately, that's what I see in so many sessions. When, when I go to sessions at, uh, at different user groups and whatnot, I see somebody teaching these solutions to these problems, and I, just, and, and I just sit there and I think, there's no way that would work. Scientifically, from a database standpoint, sure, it solves the problem. But I've got 2,000 boxes. I can't roll this out to 2,000 boxes. I can't monitor this across 2,000 boxes. I can't make changes to this across 2,000 boxes. There's no way, right? So 
my goal in this in this precon is to give you that global view. So let's go ahead and take a look. Let's see where I'm supposed to be. Oh yeah. So I'm going to exit out of this real quick and let's go to a quick demo. This is this is going to illustrate my point a little bit. I'm going to spend a little time on this. So let's say <clears throat> that you had to create an SP in a database. And again, we're back to this interactive portion, right? So I'm just going to have to do everything myself. So if I wanted to, to create this SP in DB1, let me go to DB1. There we go. I mean, this is a simple SP. It's just create at at server name. So the SP itself doesn't matter as much as the method for how I'm going to do it, right? Um, so if, if I wanted to create this SP in, in DB1, the easiest way to do that is to simply open up a query window to DB1 and hit execute, right? That will get the that will definitely get the SP into DB1. Well, what happen if what would happen if I needed to get it into two databases? I needed in DB1 and DB10. What would be the easiest way to do that? Well, the easiest way to do that, you know, is simply just go to DB1, then go to DB10 and hit execute there. What if I had to do it in five databases? Well, it's a little bit more of a pain, right? But I could go DB11, execute, DB12, execute, DB13, execute, DB14, execute. So I can, I can go through and put this in each one of those. <clears throat> but there's going to come a time when that becomes too laborious especially if you have a lot of SPs or if you have a lot of SP files, right? So there's got to be a better way to do this. <clears throat> so now let's take a look at uh, a common way that I see. Let's look at doing this in a cursor. And I hear this all the time when I teach this precon is, well, you can do it in a cursor. So here I've got something like 15, I mean 50 databases, uh, where is it? Yeah, so I've got 50 DBs here, and we're going to create the same SP in all 50 of them. <clears throat> now, we're cursoring through where, where DB name is like DB percent, and it doesn't equal DB stats, because I just want these DB numbers in here, right? And for each one of those, I'm going to say create procedure SP1 as select that at server name. And that's really easy. But the problem is, is this doesn't scale. So right now, I'm just, I'm just doing use statements, right? I can just paste this in there. Is anybody else getting that extreme static, or is it just me? Neil, are you getting it? Yeah, there is some static uh, at the moment. Let me see if I can turn my headset down. Maybe that's it. Nope. Anyway, okay. I'll do my best to look past it. It's really distracting. So right now I'm just, I'm just creating the use statements, and I can just copy those and paste them into another window, or I can do the exec itself. But like I was just saying, the problem is it doesn't scale. This is an extremely easy SP. If I had an SP that were, say, you know, two or three pages long with lots of dynamic SQL in it, then you know you'd have to go through there and hit all those double quotes and you, there's just all kinds of things you would have to do to make this a di to make to make it all fit into this guy right here so it's just not worth it this isn't a valid method for installing sps into a lot of uh, into a lot of databases so now we're going to get into a more of a scripted solution let's see where is that guy right here so right here I'm going to bring you through, uh, now, this is our first script that we're going to look at today, and most of these scripts are going to be uh, very, very similar. So, uh, of course, I've got to import the module. I'm not going to teach you uh, PowerShell right now, and in fact, this doesn't have to be done in PowerShell, but it's the best thing. It's the best tool for this. But if you're a Python guy, or if you're still a VB script guy for whatever reason, um, then you can pro you might be able to figure out how to do something like this in VB script. You should be able to. Um, so I'm going to connect a local host because it's the box I'm on, and I'm going to pass it, pass it in the SQL script that I'm interested in, which is the same one, uh, which was that first one we were looking at. 
and then uh, I'm going to come here and I'm going to I'm going to go to databases and I'm going to pull up a directory where I get I'm getting all of the databases right here except for DB stats again right where it's not equal to DB stats and then I'm going to just start inserting all these guys I'm going to I'm going to print the name and then I'm just going to run this guy on every single one of them no I believe I got ahead of myself a little bit let me go here uh, there we go. So here's how you would do that to a single database. It's the exact same thing, only now I'm just getting database equals DB1, and I can put that in DB1. Let's go ahead and run that, because I didn't run that before. Here, I'll show you. Let me come here. There we go. There we go. So I didn't run that before, and I've got to come back in here to remember which one it is. So, so single DB, there we go. I accidentally did all of them. I meant to just do the one, but I accidentally, oh no, that does all of them. So right here, I'm doing all of those to uh, a single database. And I kind of got ahead of myself again. But you can see how I've, I've put every single one of these, every single one of these guys into that uh, into that one database. So I'm pulling up a directory of star.sql from this from this uh, folder that I'm in, and I'm doing a recurse, which just means get all the subfolders as well. And then I'm printing the name, and then I'm connecting to database one, and I'm putting that uh, I'm putting that sp in each one of them. Now this, uh, as you'll see in a in another slide, is is a basic carrier method. And what I mean by carrier method, and this is the carrier method is what I call it. I've never heard anybody else use that term, so don't go, you know, don't go treating guys at work like they're idiots if they don't know what a carrier method is. But a carrier method to me <coughs> is what you use when you've got a SQL script like this, and you just want to use PowerShell as a method to carry it to all of the boxes. So you're not really doing PowerShell as much as you're just using it to connect to the to connect to the different databases that you need to connect to and then run that script in the file. So you're using PowerShell simply as a carrier for the SQL that you are already going to do. But look at all of these guys that we have here. We installed all of these guys, all of these and all of these guys as well. So it went all the way up to 74. <coughs> And it was pretty quick, too. So now, in fact, before I go on, no, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it the way it is. So now, let's say that instead of installing that one SP or all of those SPs into a single database, let's say now that I have to install it on every single one of these databases, because that's really the issue, isn't it? One, doing one by hand is just fine. Doing two by hand is just fine. Doing five by hand is just fine. Maybe, depending on how many SPs you have, if you've got you know 300 SPs, maybe even doing 10 or 15 of them by hand is fine. That line is going to be different for everybody, right? But, but at some point, there's going to be this break where you're going to say, all right, enough is enough, right? I have been on my biggest server that I've ever admined has had over 17,000 databases on it. <clears throat> and I quite often had to do stuff to every single one of them because what it was was it was a, it was a, a we, we sold a service and for every client we created a new database. Instead of having a multi-tenant database, which would have been much easier, every single client had their own database. <clears throat> so quite often when I had to install an SP, I had to install it to 17,000 databases at once, or I had to install it to these 3,000 databases or something like that, right? So this is what I'm saying, that I've, I've lived in this, in this area for many, many years. So I had to learn how to do stuff like this even before there was PowerShell. So, you know, PowerShell was just, you know, wonderful when it finally came along. So now let's let's go ahead. If I can find the right script, because I haven't done a good job at that so far, 
Um, multiple files to multiple databases. There we go. So again, this is another basic carrier script. <clears throat> so now I'm getting a list of databases. And you notice how I'm, I'm doing this a couple different ways, right? First, let's see if I can find that first one. Here I'm pulling up a directory where database, where it's like database star, right? Now, I could have done that this way here as well, except I wanted it to be more dynamic. I'm showing you different ways to do this. So here I'm actually pulling a query back, and I'm setting it equal to a variable. So cache dbs is now equal to select name from sys databases where name is like db, db percent, and, it's, and it doesn't equal uh, db stats. So I'm taking that guy, and again, I'm doing my directory, the same one I did before with my star.sql, and for every single database in dbs, this is, a, this is a for each loop right here. I'm going to set cur db, which stands for current db, equal to the name. And then I'm going to connect to that database, and I'm going to run that file. And then I'm going to print the file name to the screen. So <clears throat> for every single database, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to tie all this together here in just a minute. So let's see if I can do deploy to multiple dbs. Now, I should get some errors. Now you see these errors flashing through here every now and then. <clears throat> and the reason why you see those errors flashing through there is because in the scripts themselves, all it is is a create, uh, it's a create procedure statement. And remember, we already created this, uh, all of these SPs in DB1. So right now you're getting this error that it already exists. That's what it should be anyway. There we go. There is already an object named SP. 73 in the database. Well, yeah, because we, we created that ourselves, right, by hand in the previous example. But if I come in here and look now, it doesn't matter where I go. If I'm in DB15, I can't seem to center that. I've got all my SPs. If I'm in DB, let's go 40. Let me refresh that. Then I've got all my SPs. So let's look at this a little bit more. Let, let, let's break this down a little bit better because I, I, I need to get the brass tacks here. In fact, let me delete this. I think there was a destroy in here. Yep, destroy. So I'm going to do this. There we go. So we're going to destroy all those objects. Now here's what I'm getting at. If, if there is a breaking point to me doing this manually, whether it be five databases with 20 objects or 10 databases with 30 objects, whatever that breaking point is, I'm going to jump over to a script. But if I need to add one object to one database and I use a script, then isn't that kind of the same thing as me doing 3,000 objects to one database? Because all I have to do now, where is it, is say star.sql recurse, right? So inside this guy, installing all of these SPs is extremely simple. Putting it in one database. If I used this method, the one that's on the screen right now, the only thing that would change is this where clause, depending on which databases I wanted to put in there, right? Or I wanted to, to install the, the databases, the, the SPs in. And the only thing here that would change would be any kind of where clause, right? So I could say star.sql or I could say where, you know, where it's like this or like that or, you know, where it matches this or matches that. I can use regex for these things. I can do anything I want. Um, so really all we're arguing over here is where clauses. That's the easy part. So if I install these SPs in a single database, with a script, and then I install them in multiple databases with a script, then is there really a difference between me doing it with one database and me doing it with, you know, thousands of databases? Not really. As far as I'm concerned, I come here and I use the same script to do absolutely everything. So 
for me, I don't care if it's one database, 10 databases, or, or 17,000 databases. To me, it's the exact same thing. So you could say, as far as, as far as this task goes, or as far as me deploying objects goes, <clears throat> no matter how many databases I have in this list, I really only have one database on the server because it's so incredibly easy for me to, to do this deployment. It doesn't matter. It's only, it's only one script I have to run. So I essentially, in practice, only have one database on here. Now let's take that a step further. I don't have a script for this, but let's take that one step further. <clears throat> let's say I need to deploy this script to a uh, hundred servers or a thousand servers or two thousand servers. Now maybe you're gonna, maybe it's gonna be an SP. Maybe it'll be a job, right? Maybe it'll be a new alert. Maybe it'll be a new mail profile setup. It could be anything, right? So it doesn't have to just be an SP. But let's say that you are putting a new SP across 100 boxes and each one of them has 2,000 databases on it, right? I don't, you know, I don't have an, a necessarily a use case for that, except it would be something like the, like the, the client I had before, but, uh, or the, the job I had before where we had all those databases, one for each client. But... <clears throat> In a situation like that, it would only be a couple more lines of code for me to add in a list of servers. So if I've got this huge list of servers that I could also query, right, and I do that the exact same way that I do this, what's the difference between doing it on one server and doing it on a thousand servers as far as I'm concerned? There is no difference, right? Because, again, we're just arguing over the where clause. So, in essence, I've really only got one server in my environment. I could have 3,000, 5,000 servers in my environment. And for a lot of these tasks, I, I, I do my, my admin with a script. And, in essence, I've only got one server. And if you think about it that way, then admin becomes a lot easier and scripting becomes a lot more important and you get a lot more of your day back. So uh, this, this calls into, into uh, question, or actually this brings up the next point here of <clears throat> my enterprise philosophy. So my enterprise philosophy is to be busy. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm reading my, I'm reading my, my thing wrong. Um, there's a difference between being busy and being productive, right? So we, we have a household here of two DBAs. We're constantly, you know, going to different client offices or working with different clients and doing one thing or another. At one point, we were both FTEs and we both worked in separate offices. And when we did, we would come home and we'd discuss our day. So how was your day? What did you do? Oh, well, you know, I fixed a couple replication problems and I solved this, uh, this issue with, uh, you know, with a user account and I restored a couple TDE databases to the dev box and, you know, just a couple other miscellaneous things like that. And you're like, oh, so you weren't, so you weren't very productive, huh? No, no, just busy. Yeah, that's a shame. <clears throat> so there is a difference between being busy and being productive. Creating a user account in a, on a server, busy or productive? It's busy. How about restoring a database to the dev box so that they so that the the devs can can uh, do something, or restoring it to the QA box so that somebody can troubleshoot something? Busy or productive? <clears throat> That's definitely busy work as well. How about? Um, fixing a replication problem. Yeah, that's definitely busy work as well. Anything that keeps the lights on and keeps things running <clears throat> is busy work. Anything that furthers your database initiative and makes your job easier or your user's job easier, <clears throat> that is being productive. So, Productive things are things like setting up a new AG, right? 
um, overhauling your backups to use Minion Backup. <laughs> you like that little plug there? Um, but stuff like that, uh, you know, uh, standardizing your alerts, um, standardizing, you know, uh, your naming conventions or, f or getting all of your maintenance plans worked out so that they all run at the same time or, uh, you know, standardizing your file growth rates, you know, stuff like that is definitely productive work because it improves your actual situation instead of just keeping the lights on. So <clears throat> one thing that uh, one thing that I like to say is that I cannot make you more productive and I'm not trying to make you more productive with with uh, these scripts. What I'm trying to do is take away your busy work so that you can turn around and be more productive. No, since this is an enterprise scripting course, it would it would be remiss of me to not explain that this is not an enterprise level script. We talk about all of that in the precon, but this is a basic do-it-yourself kind of bottom of the barrel script that has nothing to do with enterprise whatsoever. Enterprise scripts have some very strict guidelines that you have to follow and there are some very important things that you need to do for it to be an enterprise script. And what we do in the session is we, we will take something like this and we will show you how to build it into an enterprise script by adding things, taking things away, changing things, and we will build this, this script so that by the time you're finished, you're going to know how to build this, this whole complicated scripting system that's going to be easy to deploy, easy to manage, easy to make changes to, easy to move around if you need to, and easy to run. So, you know, don't look at this script and just think that, oh, well, he's just going to show us how to do three or four things and scripts and then kick us all on our way. Not even close. We're going to discuss the best ways to connect to SQL. We're going to discuss all of the, the different ways that you can do things and the best ways to do them. Like, you know, should you be using PBM or SIS for these things? Uh, which scripting language should you be using? What's the best way to connect to SQL through .NET? And so on and so on. So we're going to talk about all of this stuff. And we're going to give you some very strict guidelines for creating very rich scripts. So, you know, don't take, this is just an example script just to get the point across. But we've got a very lovely progression uh, take going from a very simple script like this all the way into a full-fledged enterprise script. And by the end of it, you're going to look at a lot of the scripts on the Internet and go, wow, that's not even close to a good script. Anyway, okay, let's see, where am I? Oh, yes, here I am. So, you know, I've used the word enterprise probably about 40 times in the last two minutes alone, right? So... The question has to come, what is an enterprise? I mean, we're doing enterprise scripting. I'm a big-time enterprise DBA, right? So we have to say, what is an enterprise? <clears throat> and again, this is where the, uh, uh, this is where the, the interactivity of the class usually kicks in. So I'm having to do this all myself. <clears throat> So I'm just going to go ahead and give you the bottom line. For me, a good working definition of an enterprise is anything I don't want to do by hand. So that means that if I have 50 databases on here and I've got a and I've got a you know a, an SP that I need to install in all of them, and I don't want to do that by hand because who wants to sit there and go? You know, connect to database one, database two, database three, database four, database five. Nobody wants to do that 50 times. Officially, that's an enterprise. Hell, if I've got a single database on a single server and I've got 300 schemas in that database and I've got to and I've got to add a user to each one of those schemas. Yeah, I don't want to do that by hand. I'm going to find a way to script it. And as far as I'm concerned, doing something against 300 objects. That makes it an enterprise to me. If I, a lot of people define an enterprise solely by a number of servers, but 
it's not it's a it's a number of objects, not just a number of servers. So whatever you're doing, if you've got I you know one of my uh, Minion Reindex customers has over 350,000 tables in a single database. Anytime he needs to do anything at all to those tables, if he needs to 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 cycle through and do something on all those tables, I guarantee you that's an enterprise to him because it's all about the objects. It has nothing to do with how many actual servers or how much size or or their role in the company. It does, none of that stuff matters when the rubber hits the road and you actually need to get something done. So an enterprise is solely anything I don't want to do by hand. And to me, that's most of the stuff I see out there, right? Most of the stuff I see I wouldn't want to do by hand. I wouldn't want to uh, put manual, I don't like putting manual alerts on boxes that email me when there's a problem. Say, you know, this database backup failed or this reindex failed or there's a problem with this check DB or something like that. I don't like putting those manual kinds of things out there because that's 3,000 or 2,000 or 500 different um, uh, <clears throat> different uh, DB mail scenarios I have to manage and troubleshoot. And those are all of those, uh, that's all those SMTP relays I have to get exceptions for from my exchange guys. And, you know, DB mail goes out sometimes. SMTP has problems, and the more servers I have it on, the more the more problems I'm going to have. And with something like that, I'm probably not going to find out until it's too late, until it hasn't been sending me any alerts for a couple months and I start seeing problems. And then go out there and notice, huh, mail's not working on this box. Go figure. So, you know, I don't like managing things on hundreds of servers like that, on thousands of servers individually like that. It's just not good enterprise practice. So to me, that is an enterprise, not you know, not having objects out on every single box like that. Um, now let's talk about real quick, if we've got a few minutes, let's let's talk about a few enterprise mistakes that DBAs make. And looking at the time, this may be the last thing that I get to talk about um, before we before we open it up to questions. So there are a few really big mistakes that DBAs make in the enterprise. First and foremost, and I see this so much is writing processes for single situations. <clears throat> Guys, one-off solutions are not solutions. <clears throat> I've seen this so much where a DBA will take, oh, well, look, I've got this problem with this backup. Okay, well, all I have to do is make this little change to the routine on this box, and then it'll be humming right along. And he's right. It will be humming right along. But now that routine is different from everything else you're doing in your shop and nobody else is going to know about it except you. And in two months, you won't even remember that you did it. And it's going to be acting funny, and you're going to look at it, and you're going to go, who the hell did this? Because you may not even remember who did it. And you're going to go, oh, I did that. That's right. But it's going to be half a day of troubleshooting and scratching your head before you find that. So one-off solutions are not solutions. Don't ever, ever make a one-off solution for anything. Of course there are exceptions. If you've got an AG or if you've got some other scenario on a single box that doesn't exist anywhere else, that would be a one-off solution. But those are so, those are oftentimes so rare that they're not even worth mentioning. Most of the time when you have a problem in an enterprise, it's something that you could have everywhere. And you always need to assume that any problem that you have, any fix that you apply, you may have to apply to hundreds of servers. So always ask yourself when you're doing this, is this a, an isolated situation or is this something that I need to fix across all my boxes? Now a really good, uh, a really good example of this is something I ran across a couple years ago when... Uh, when I was at a client and this uh, one of the devs came up to me and he said, you know, I've got a problem. I'm trying to insert 50,000 rows into this table and the log keeps filling up on me. And I was like, well, then I guess you need to get more log space. And he's like, yeah, but every time I look, we've got something like 200 gigs. And I'm like, wow, um, okay, I think 50,000 rows ought to be able to fit in 200 gigs. And so after looking at it, I noticed that the growth rate on the log 
was something like 270,000 percent. So what was happening clearly is the he was trying to insert his rows. There wasn't enough room in the log, so the log went to grow. There's not enough room on the drive for the log to grow all the way out, so the operation failed and rolled back. <clears throat> well, I, I set that to a more reasonable level. I like a gig. And, of course, his insert went just fine. That's a one-off solution. But then I applied it to the entire enterprise. I wrote a script that checked for all of the all of the data and file growth rates across the entire enterprise, and they had they had over 3,000 servers. And that was over 3,000 servers, right? So I wrote a script that gathered all those, logged them all to a table, and then I looked at all the growth rates, and I noticed that they had data and log growth rates from everything from one meg all the way up to several hundred thousand percent. Well, that's just a ridiculous amount of growth rate for anything. So I standardize that across the board. Will there be exceptions? You can come in here and say, well, this is a tiny database. The log doesn't need to grow at a gig because it's, you know, it's on really tight space, so let's make it 10 megs. Sure, whatever, right? There are those, out of over 3,000 boxes, there's going to be a handful of those exceptions. Whatever, I don't care. But the point is, is that I didn't just apply that fix to that one box. So... Another one, another mistake that DBAs make is building in manual processes. I see this just as much as I see one-off solutions. <clears throat> you build in a process that, that, that you have to intervene or you have to kick off all the time. Man, it's not a process if it involves me. Nothing worth anything in my enterprise runs because, I, because I'm at work kicking it off. That's a horrible way to do things. You're going to be on vacation. You're going to get sick. You're going to forget. Something else is going to come up. There are a dozen things that could, that could happen easily to keep that process from being run by you. So anything that relies on you is not a good process. So don't build manual processes. Sometimes you can't help but build in semi-manual processes, right? Because you have to rely on some on some third-party thing where, you know, you do your portion of it, then somebody else has to do their portion of it, and then they come back to you. But with any luck, your, your portion of it is going to be automated, and you can find a way, hopefully, to automate the rest of it because you don't want to get into this, oh, well, we have to do this every day or every week, and so we have to coordinate this so that, you know, every single time. No, 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 no. You, you can come up with something that will uh, that will kick that off, right? Um, a good example of that is <clears throat> is one time uh, I had to wait, I had to kick off a process and then wait for somebody else to do something, in which case they sent me an email and then I finished my part of the process. Well, instead, I wrote an SIS package that did my portion of it and then uh, and, and then I had a file watcher and I told them instead of emailing me, create a text file in this folder. And as soon as they created that text file, the, the file watcher saw it was there and then finished my portion of the process. I'm not really concerned with their manual process. I'm concerned with my manual process. And you see, now this, this kind of kicks back in those stories that I, I began with, right? When I was talking about the tennis, well, you know, when I was talking about being, being uh, kicked back and forth across the tennis court. If I have to constantly do do things in a manual way, and I'm, I'm constantly having to go from one server to another server to these databases to those databases to this over here to that over there to that over there to that over there, I'm going to get so busy and I'm going to get so confused, I'm going to start making mistakes. And that's when things really start to fall under. I don't believe in it. Instead of letting your users knock you from one side of the court to the other until you make a mistake, why don't you sit in the middle and kick stuff back at them? You know what, um, you know, when they say something like, hey, you know, uh, <clears throat> I need to know the last time my backups kicked off, or I need to know my database growth, or I need to know this, or I need to know that. You know what, guys, I've put up an SRS server, and I've got those reports. Every single time they ask you a question, you can say, you know, here's the report, here's the report, here's the report. But you're knocking it, you're knocking them from one side of the court to the other, right? It's that self-service thing that we that, that's been so popular the last few years, right? But 
you know, if a user comes to you and says, I need this, and it has to be done across hundreds or thousands of databases on a single server or multiple servers, it should be just as trivial as if they said, I need to do this against, you know, the, can you run this SP in this one database? You should strive to make, to make things like that just as trivial. I had a... I had a situation just like that about three or four years ago where this one server had thousands of databases on it, not this one server, this one application <clears throat> had like seven or nine servers and every one of those servers had thousands of databases on them. And, oh, I don't know, every two or three weeks they would get some new set of, of contractors in that had to have read only on every single one of those databases on every one of those servers. Now you're talking like seven or nine servers with thousands of databases on each one, you know, so we're talking about tens of thousands of databases. <clears throat> when I first started there, the DBAs were manually clicking through every single one of those and adding them into the read only group. And I was like, I don't even understand what you're doing. That doesn't make sense. So I took a couple hours and wrote a script that handled that. It took all of those databases and all of those servers into account. And when they wanted to do that, I just entered in the new contractor name and I hit go. And it went in and it added him as a login and it gave him access to, and it gave him read-only access to every database on every single one. It took about five minutes probably for it to go through that. Maybe not even that. And I emailed the guy and said, done. It used to take them like a week and a half to get that done. Now it took like under five minutes. And he was astounded. Okay, now I need him, now I need him removed and the next group of guys is coming in. I have no idea why they had so many contractors. But every two or three weeks it was this cycle that took the DBA team forever to get this done every single time. And I made it a trivial task with a simple script. So, <clears throat> you know, to to do these things shouldn't be laborious. There's no excuse for it anymore. We've got way too much at our disposal. Hey, Neil, is this about the time I should shut up and wait for questions? Yes. Okay, then I'll shut up and wait for questions. That's. That, I had a couple more points, but I'm I'm easy. I can. Uh, uh, I, I can let it go now and see if there. Got a couple of minutes. Uh, we... Go ahead. Okay, uh, let me just bring up the question pane and uh, explain that. So one of the questions we did have was around the what version of PowerShell will the scripts work under? So does the host have to be the same version of PowerShell SQL? So I mean, I need to some understanding about the versions of PowerShell out there. Right. So the version of PowerShell really isn't that important. Um, the only thing that matters in the case of this script, because this is a very basic script. Uh, would be something like the version of SQL. So you're either going to use import module with SQL 2012 and above, or you're going to use the old uh, uh, you're going to use the old uh, oh what is it a uh, create command uh, add ps snap in that you had to for for SQL 08. But the version of PowerShell itself, no, it's unimportant. So another question that we have is. Where can we find uh, or kind of the best place to place SQL scripts for kind of the enterprise? And so, you know, do we have a framework we put it into? You no, know, do we do use templates? Right. So yeah, I'm a big believer in templates. Uh, we talk about that ad nauseum in the in the precon. I mean, if if you really want to know this stuff, the precon is the way to go because we. We discover, I mean, we, we discuss all this stuff ad nauseum in the precon. But yes, I'm a big believer in templates. And if you have a team, then it's really best if you put it on a network share somewhere so everybody can get to it. Um, I advise that you keep security on that, not because they're your scripts and, oh, my God, I don't want anybody seeing my scripts, but you don't want people out there accidentally modifying your scripts unless they're, unless they're, unless they're authorized. So... You know, if it's if it's just you in the shop, then keep it on your local box, but definitely back it up somewhere on the network in case something happens to your local box. You don't want to have to to reproduce all of these things. But if you've got a team, then definitely put it somewhere where the where the team can get to it. But don't allow everybody on the team to to modify the scripts unless you trust everybody on the team. 
and of course you can also keep them in a code vault as well so if somebody does modify a script in a way that you don't like then you can always you know you can always rely on versioning right so another question has come in from Peter um, this one is PowerShell can work for not only SQL any URL or way to learn PowerShell scripts for that only for the DBA so there's so many scripts out there for, around PowerShell is kind of where's the best place to go for kind of DBA based scripts I suspect <clears throat> right so uh, actually, um, I don't do scripts as much, but I do teach uh, a lot of beginning PowerShell specifically for DBAs, and I've got a lot of I've got something like over 40 videos on on different PowerShell tasks, um, specifically in SQL on Midnight DBA. So if you just go to midnightdba.com, uh, you should be able to find you know tons of PowerShell stuff, including bottom of the barrel, I've never even spelled PowerShell before, how do I get started sort of thing where I explain absolutely everything from the ground up. And of course, if you have any questions about that, then feel free to email me. I don't, I don't mind answering questions in email at all. Uh, quite a few thank yous for the session and the uh, material you provided. Um, I'm looking at the time clock, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, so if there's final points you want to push across there, uh, Sean, now's the time and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Okay, it's, you, you, you see I didn't end up using most of the slides that we made. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's see, so questions, here we are. This is where we're supposed to be, right? There we go. Ah, I said from the beginning, sorry. I need to go here. It's going to take me a couple minutes to pull my head out from current slide. That's where we want to be. And now, is this you or me? This is you, isn't it? Uh, this is me again. So, um, so. Thank you, uh, Sean, for the fantastic session and the, and the kind of insights you've given us around enterprise scripting. Obviously, if you've liked what you heard, then Sean will be presenting at the Pass Summit 2015. And um, we also, uh, you know, can kind of learn a lot more about this enterprise scripting uh, kind of approach by attending his pre-conference session. So please go to the summit website, and you can actually register for the pre-conferences. They're $495. And I believe there's some spaces, a few spaces left on your, your one there. Also, Sean, will be doing a general session. Um, one of my kind of uh, favorite things I, I like to learn about is a kind of regular expressions for DBA. And monster text manipulation is a session that Sean will be doing during the summit itself. I'm not sure which day, but uh, Sean may be able to advise on that. Again, if you haven't registered for the summit, use the discount code 24HOP15, and you can save yourself $200 off the current price, which will change on Sunday the 20th. And, hey, uh, go ahead. Uh, I want to say some. I want to say one more thing real quick. Um, that monster text manipulation session. I have never had anybody walk out of there that didn't say, "Oh my God, that was so fabulous." That this is my favorite session to date, next to my backup tuning session, because it's not. It's not about developers. I'm not showing you how to use regex like in, in .NET or CLR, right? This is actually for DBAs and it's amazing because it's a lot like the scripting course. I'm showing you how to do just a, a ton of things that we have to do all the time and using regex to format all kinds of things and to get just huge things done in just a few seconds. If you've never done it before, I teach it from the ground up and it's a phenomenal session. I've never had anybody walk away who didn't who didn't just just fall all over and start using it the second they left the room. It's Excellent. one of my favorite sessions of all time. Well, thank you for that. Um, if you can go to the uh, next slide, I think, for me, uh, for sure. And uh, so you can follow Pass 24 Hours Hop um, through the hashtag and at SQL Pass. And I think we have the next slide, which is the one for the next session, which is just starting right now. So. The next session available on 25 Hours of Pass is the top eight reasons for your transaction performance problems. So Margarita Noamova will be presenting that one. Sean, thank you very much. We need to end this one. Please fill in the, uh, the survey that's going to follow this, and thank you guys for attending. Thanks, guys.